Hello my unapologetic beauties, welcome to another episode of Unapologetically Her, hosted by yours truly, Natalie Nadine. Unapologetically Her is a podcast created to not only tackle all things female and urban pop culture, but to empower, embrace, and educate the women of today's society. Welcome back to another episode of Unapologetically Her, the podcast that's for her, by her. And for today's episode, I am joined by playwright, author, producer, what? Actor, just everything in between. I always say this is a full circle moment for me. I am joined by the Trey Anthony to me. He's like a Canadian legend, honey. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. You guys, I was just telling uh, Ms. Anthony before the podcast that this is like a full circle moment for me from watching the kink in my hair. Can you hear no? My hair, show me what is going on. with my mom like that was our weekly show we never missed an episode to meeting her in grade eight to now interviewing her this is a big honor so thank you so much for being on the podcast oh thank you natalie i really appreciate it it's really full circle (laughs) it is (laughs) that's amazing right i love it i love it before we get into anything let people know where they can follow you where they can find you support you run you a check it is covid (laughs) yes write me a check i like that natalie we're starting off right um, you can find me at Black Girl in Love on Instagram. I'm under Trey Anthony on Facebook and also on um, Twitter. I'm not so good on Twitter. You can also find me on LinkedIn. And for more information about me, you could definitely check out my website, which is treyanthony.com. And that's T R E Y A N T H O N Y.com. And buy my book. My book is being sold wherever books are sold yes. Amazon, Audible, a different book list, Barnes and Noble, you name it, it's out there. So buy the book, Black Girl in Love with Herself. Yes. Perfect. Now you already know your girl got her copy. There you the go. ebook and the physical <laughs> copy. So that's how you know it's real. <laughs> it's real. It's real. It's real. It's a definitely a labor of love. And yes. I'm so glad that women are just, you know, really just scooping it up and loving it. Oh my God. I can't wait to get into the book because I read this probably within like what, two, three days. I was just like, oh, I have highlights and everything in the book. Oh, nice. They love that. I had to make some notes. I'm like, oh, this is good. Oh, I can relate to this. I'm like, mom, you're next. Yes, it's funny. We're doing a Mother's Day show um, coming up. And because so many women have said they bought the book for themselves and their mothers, or they bought the book and then passed it on to their moms, or their mom gave it to them. And then they were like, no, mom, you should read it as well. (laughs) So I'm going to be doing a Mother's Day show with my mom. So yeah, that's coming up. Yeah, oh, so I can't cool. miss that because I'm like, oh, because yeah. I'm like also Jamaican mother as well. So I'm just like, <laughs> here you go, mother. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> like, this is for us. This is for us. Not you, but it's for us. us. It's for us. It's definitely for us. <laughs> so before we get to the questions, I just want to know how have you been, especially with COVID going on and everything? We're going, what, a year with this now? Like, how have you been doing? It's been good, but I think for me, and there's been, you know, some, of course, some really stressful moments, but I've been very Mm -hmm. conscious and very intentional about really taking care of my mental health and well-being. And so Mm -hmm. like I write in the book, Black Girl in Love with Herself, there's things that I do daily. And one of them is like meditating, Mm -hmm. going for a walk, jog, run, um, making contact with people like you know, FaceTiming my friends, um, really setting aside time sometimes for me to just do a little quick 24 or 48 hour getaway to a beach in Florida right now. And so I'm very fortunate that I'm about 40 minutes away from the beach. So I kind of go on the down days when, you know, no one's there on a Tuesday morning or something like that and walk the beach. And so it's really intentional because um, as I mentioned in the book, you know, I was diagnosed with depression. And mm-hmm. so I have to be really intentional about how I take care of my mental health in these times and in a pandemic. And yeah. I think as black women, we're so used to just getting up and getting things done yeah. and 
ignoring when we're not feeling well. And especially when we're mentally not feeling well, we ignore that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had to really practice what I preach because I'm all about Black women and our well-being and our health. Yes. Oh, first of all, you just, you had me lost when you said Florida. I just heard the beat. Yeah. <laughs> I look like it up the window, like it is cloudy, it's yes. cold. <laughs> And I had to do that. That was another thing for me. I had to really realize that weather really yeah. affects me. And so I need to be around sunshine. I really need to be able to go out and feel the sun on my face. And mm-hmm. it really affects my moods. And I really realized that when I lived in Canada, some of you know my deepest, darkest moments or depression were in the winter. Like, I'm just not good with winter. I'm just not. Oh, I don't know seasonal any Black depression. Person, yeah, seasonal depression, right? Mm. And I don't know which Black people are, but I'm just like, if, if I have a choice, I'm going to yeah. be in the sun. Absolutely. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm just loving, you know, every day's having great weather. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you just said yeah, to Sorry, quick. Toronto folks. I'm sorry. Hate me now. Hate me now. <laughs> Just a little bit, just a little bit. A little bit, just a little bit, yeah. (laughs) So my first major question for you is, what inspired you to write a self-love book and why was now the time? Mm -hmm. For me, it really was about, I had just really um, transitioned quite easily Mm -hmm. into talking about my own self-help journey. You know, I had started, you know, eating better, losing weight, running, and people were asking me questions, right? And then um, also, I I don't think there's a self-help book that I have not read, right? I'm a Mm self-help junkie. I'm always ordering a book, you know? And so when I started reading these books, as much as I related to a lot of the books, there Mm -hmm. were some things that as a Black woman, just could not resonate with me fully. Like for example, um, that self-help book by Sheryl Sandberg, as much as I loved it, lean in, right? Mm -hmm. We know as black women, we can lean in and what we are leaning into, if we are leaning in, sometimes we are viewed then as aggressive or intimidating or not a team player, right? So there's a lot of things that kind of like the blanket approach or when um, some other white self-help authors will talk about, you know, sometimes you got to just cry about it and take a break. And we as Black women, we have been conditioned the opposite, right? Yeah. So we have to go against that stereotype. And that's what I talk about in the book, the strong Black woman mm-hmm. trope is very real for us, right? Yes. And we don't go to therapy as often as our white counterparts, right? It's Mm -hmm. viewed as like, I remember when I told my mother I was going to therapy, she was like, why are you telling all those white people your business, right? (laughs) So all of those things I realized were not addressed Mm -hmm. in the self-help market. It was kind of like a one size fits all for women. And I was like, it is not. Mm -mm. And so I felt it was one of those things where they say, I think it was Maya Angelou who said, you know, um, write the book that you want to read. And for yeah. me, that was what it really was. It might not be my angel. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But anyways, <laughs> and I read it somewhere. Write the book you want to read. And yeah. for me, it could have been Toni Morrison. I'm not sure now. But I, I was like, I'm going to write the book that I wanted to read. Mm-hmm. And I approached um, Hay House. And Hay House, because I had been a big fan of Louise Hay, um, the book, You Can Heal Your Life was a book that could really change my life. And I gave that book out like it was candy to friends, family, everybody. I was like, you've got to read this book. So when I approached um, Hay House, they had said to me, well, write a book about love and about relationships and how you've manifested this wonderful relationship. Because at that point in time, I was in what I thought was a healthy, wonderful relationship. And they said, mm-hmm. in that, you could also give tips to women about love and relationships and loving themselves. So I was like, that's great. Yeah. And then five months before my book was due, I got a text from my partner who said, I no longer want to do this relationship. And my four year Mm. relationship just blew up in my face. And I just felt like such a fraud. I felt so stupid. I felt like, how did I miss this? Yeah. And so I called the publisher and I was like, I can't write this book. Like it would be inauthentic for me to be giving relationship advice mm. and telling women how to find, you know, the love of their life and a good partner, a good husband, a good boyfriend, whatever. Yeah. And I missed the tsunami that was hitting my own life. Right? Yeah. And so then they said to me, okay, fair enough. Then what can you write? 
and I said, I'm going to write a book about why I was so invested in having this relationship that gave me my own self worth Mm -hmm. and how I gave away the job of loving myself to someone else. So when they walked out of my life, I no longer felt lovable. Yes. And so I said, I want to talk to women about how do we give that job away to others and how can we start loving ourselves? So when people meet us, they are not completing us, but they're contributing to the love that we already have. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of what it was. It really was this journey for me. It was um, something that I really, as I was going through my process, I was writing everything because I really wanted to share Mm my journey and my self-revelation to other Black women. I like that because it's like how you said, there were not a lot of books that we can really identify with and see ourselves with. And that's why I think for me personally, I've never actually picked up one of those books. Yes. Because I'm like, representation matters. I always tell people that, especially Mm -hmm. when it comes to media. So when you look at these books, you don't really see someone that looks like you on the cover. But then they yeah. tell you how to live your life. And I'm like, <laughs> this can't work. And then when I read this book, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. We, in a sense, both born outside of Jamaica, outside of Jamaica, grew up outside of Jamaica, have Caribbean parents, went through all these things. And I'm like, I can relate to this. I see myself when reading this book. And I find that's yeah. very important that we don't have. Yes. I love how you, and especially how you said, like, you didn't want to be a fraud with it. Like, you want to really show and wear your heart on your sleeve, that's the biggest thing. Because a lot of people, despite what happens to them, they're going to be like, well, I'm just going to write it anyways. And if they buy it, they buy it. Yes, yeah. exactly. exactly. And for me, it was really important. Um, I think, Natalie, like you mentioned, also having Caribbean parents. Mm-hmm. Um, even as we, there's a lot of African-American women who have bought this book as well. And But there's also been what I've seen of this surge of a lot of us who have Caribbean parents who are like, this is the first time I've seen just the authenticity of what it's like growing up in a Caribbean household, right? And so that was really important for me to instill. Like, you know, there's parts where I talk about my mother and my grandmother, even in the audio version of the book, Mm -hmm. I make sure that I do it in a Caribbean accent when I'm talking about my mother and grandmother. There's a mention of the food that we eat, some of my favorite Caribbean dishes the playlists at each um, chapter, there's some dance hall tracks put in there as well. You Mm -hmm. know, so it was really important for me to say, this is who we are and this is us. And um, I was really glad that black women all felt that they felt they saw themselves in these words. Absolutely. Oh, Oh, sorry, like like the first second question, I'm already here for it. So my next question for you is throughout the book, you mentioned the concept of the strong black woman, a concept that goes back through generations. As you got older and did some self-reflection, would you consider it a positive trait or a generational curse? I think it can be both. Mm -hmm. I really do think it can be both. Um, As I mentioned in the book, I will definitely say there is no way that I could have had the success that I've had and the career that I had if I wasn't raised by strong black women who told me to get up, who told me, and I'm sure everybody who's listening to this podcast, if you're a woman of color, you know the whole saying where our parents sit us down and go, you got to work twice as hard to get as far as that, right? So we all know that and we all do it, right? And you know, um, I remember my grandmother used to always say to me, like when I would compare myself to Susie and we'll be like, well, Susie can do it. My grandmother would say, cat and dog don't have the same look, (laughs) right? So I've grown up with all of these sayings, right, around how you move through the world as a Black woman, right? And you know there are certain things you cannot do, nope. right? And there are certain things you have to excel at yes. to get to where you are, right? You, you can't, and I remember my mother used to always say to me, you cannot be average. No. You cannot be average, right? You have to be exceptional. Yes. So those are the things that have been instilled in my mind. But in the same manner, I feel as a strong black woman, it also has affected me because as I said in the book, there were times when I wanted to cry 
There were times when I was tired and I should have been resting. There were times when I wanted to be vulnerable and there was no space to do that. So even in the book, I describe when my relationship blew up in my face and I had Mm -hmm. a two week old baby. I was mourning the demise of my relationship. Mm -hmm. I had to move out of the home that I had shared with my partner at the time. We were in a damn pandemic (laughs) and all of these things were falling on me. And to say I was feeling overwhelmed was an understatement. Like all Mm -hmm. of my live shows and events and talks were being canceled. So I was worried about money. And I remember my mom and sister came down um, because I was in Atlanta at that time and they came to um, Atlanta to help me pack up my apartment. And one day I just broke down in the bathroom in front of my mother. And this was the first time I felt like I'd actually really just been vulnerable and cried. And I was like, mom, I don't think I can do this. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can do this. And my mother turned around and she said to me, you know, she didn't hug me physically or any of those things. She just kind of said to me, she looked me in the eye and she was just like, remember whose daughter you are, remember whose granddaughter you are. And Mm -hmm. me and your grandmother had it way worse. And Mm. as I mentioned in the book, I said, I realized at that moment that my mom could give me pep talks. She could be my cheerleader, but what she could not be and didn't know how to do was be a safe place for me and say to me, Mm -hmm. you might want to cry about this. It's okay to not have all the answers. I'm here to support you emotionally. I understand that you're feeling weak. And at that point in time, I just wanted to break down. I just wanted to fall apart mm-hmm. and I wasn't given the permission to do so. And as I reflected, I also thought about how many times had I been my mother to friends and family members in my life where oh. when I knew they were going through trauma or any kind of stress, mm-hmm. I didn't address it. I would just say to them, come on, girl, you know, you got this. You you, you ain't gonna make this kill you. Get up, girl, get up. And yes, that's good. But I think more often we should also provide a space to black women and say, hey girl, Mm -hmm. do you wanna cry about this? This may be a lot for you. I can see you're in pain. How can I support you through your pain, right? And, And it's okay to cry, you can lean on me. Right. And don't tell women you got this because a lot of times some of us don't got it. No. And if we don't got it, where are we going to go? Especially when people assume all of the time that we got it. Mm-hmm. Right. And that is what I really wanted to reexamine and really readdress of how as black women, we offer not only support to others, but to ourselves in a yeah. way that feels safe and emotionally vulnerable. And so that's why I say the strong black woman thing, it's a curse and also a blessing because it has worked for me in many areas of my life, yes. but it also has led to a lot of anguish in my life as well. Ooh. See, that, that was the part that got me in the book where like, I feel like I was that friend to be like, girl, you got this, like, don't worry, we're just gonna move past it. Like we're just, you know, just get up and go. And it's the fact that no, sometimes we do need that time to cry, let it out. And I think there's many times where in private, like you said, we'll cry, we'll do everything. But when we have to face people, yeah. then that's when we put on this mask to the point we where we this- up in- mm-hmm. inside. Yes. Yeah. And I have done it so often myself where, you know, I'll be crying in my car, right? Or mm. crying in front of the bathroom mirror. And then, you know, my friends are coming out, coming over, I'm going out with my friends and I'm putting on my lipstick and I'm like, hey, yeah, girl, how are you doing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Instead of being like, you know what? I'm really struggling. And I had to start to admit that. And even on Instagram and things like that, now I'm much more vulnerable on mm-hmm. the things that I post. Just like two weeks ago, I, I, I posted something and said, this has been a hard week for yes. me you know, and I had to really address my depression this week and really um, deal with that and address that and take some time for myself. Mm -hmm. And so many women were just like, thank you for saying that, right? Because I think on Instagram, we get the highlight reel. And when you see everybody, quote unquote, doing well or doing better Mm -hmm. than you, you're kind of like, well, what's wrong with me? They seem to have it all together. What's wrong with me? And I'm like, no, yeah. And you're just like, no, I want people to see an accurate depiction of what life is. There's highs, there's lows, there's middle ground. There's times that you feel like, yes, I'm superwoman. And then there's other times you can barely get out of bed, Mm -hmm. right? 
And we need to be able as black women to say all of those days are important and essential. You can have all of those days, your good days, your bad days, your middle days, your extreme, your crying days, the days when you're like, I got this. But as black women, we're not allowed to have those. No. And I'm saying, yes, we should. We should be able to have those days. Yeah. Kind of just reinforcing it, Lane, you know, like, it's okay. They can have it. You can have it too. Yes. You're allowed exactly. to have a balance of both. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Ooh. Now, my next question for you is, and then we, you brought on this topic a little bit earlier in terms of therapy. So as of late, therapy is being accepted within the Black community, I would think, more and more these mm-hmm. days. Yes. What do you say to those who remain hesitant about it or think it's a waste of money? Also, how has it helped you? And what are the key factors we should be looking for when searching for the right therapist? A little bit of a long question. (laughs) For sure. Um, I wrote a whole chapter um, pretty much on therapy and um, Mm self-help in Black Girl in Love with Herself because I thought it was essential for us to talk about. And I'm very aware of the financial accessibility um, for a lot of people. Like um, sometimes therapy is not affordable. And I've said to a lot in the book, I give a a list of resources of where women can go to Mm -hmm. get um, alternative cheaper therapy as well. Um, I also say to women that you can also ask, a lot of therapists nowadays are doing sliding scale and you can ask your your therapist, you know, do you do a sliding scale? Um, That is something, there's also a lot of online therapy courses now where you can pay $45 for the month and meet with a therapist um, four times a week mm-hmm. and, you, and you do Zoom calls and all of that and texting and all. So there's all, all of the list of things like that. And I do think to try it, I mm-hmm. think to try it, I think we all need that one space once a week where it's an hour just for us to talk about what we are going through. And I have seen the difference in my life. I've seen the difference in my friends who are in therapy. Mm -hmm. I see the difference in family members who are going through therapy. You just move through the world in a different way. And I have been very vocal and said, I would not be or choose to be in a relationship with anyone who has not done therapy. And and that's just the truth because you will see how different people's childhoods will come up in relationships if they have not done their work. And I also say that in my friendships, like I encourage every single one of my friends to go to therapy. And because I see how they relate to me, I see how they relate to others, to their children. And I think it's essential for us as black women to know that it's important. And one of the questions that, you know, I give a list in the book of questions that you should ask Mm -hmm. um, therapists when you're, and you are interviewing them and Mm -hmm. you should interview them. You shouldn't go with the first therapist. You know, it's good to sometimes get referrals and recommendations. You know, I've referred my therapist to thousands of women right now, right? But I will say like, you should also ask them, especially, you know, have they worked with women of color before, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's also really essential if you can to get a person of color. I love, my therapy changed completely when I got a black therapist, right? And it just went to a whole different level. And so I would ask them, you know, are you used to working with women who are maybe in same gendered um, partnerships? Are you used to um, uh, dealing with women who are working class? Are you used to dealing with immigrant women? You know, it's Mm. all of these questions that you should ask them. You know, you should also ask them like, what kind of therapy do you perform? Like there are some therapists who just kind of provide you with a space to talk. There are some therapists who actually Mm -hmm. give you like homework and action plans and action steps, Mm -hmm. you know? So you have to kind of figure out what therapy works for you, right? And the type that you like. And you also, as I said to a lot of women um, in the book, you have the chance and the choice to, if it's, it's not a good fit to find someone else. Right. Because there's a lot of times people are like, oh, well, you know, I've committed to this and now I don't know how to get out of it. You can leave at any time. If it doesn't feel like a good fit, trust your gut until you find the right therapist who works for you. Right. So Mm -hmm. those are things that I truly do recommend. And I believe in therapy with all my whole heart of that. We need it. It's essential for our well-being. Well, I like the part when you said you need to interview your therapist, because I think a lot of people have that notion where like, okay, I'm just going to go with this name on the list and I'm just going to give it a shot. 
yeah. but to ask like these specific questions like I hope ladies men so you know if there's a man listening out there yeah I really yes. hope you took some notes because this is something that's universal and can help a lot of people I love that you said that and I feel like yes. that's a conversation a lot of people are having so I feel like again if you guys get this book I'm gonna just show it real quick get the book it's all in there and that is one of the things that people have <laughs> said to me not only is it a book but you provide resources yes you know? And I said, because I don't want, I don't want any of us to have an excuse. I don't want you to be like, oh, Trey wrote a chapter on therapy, but now I don't know what to do. I can't find a therapist. I give you all of the resources that you can go and find the therapist. Mm -hmm. I give you everything in that Right. So I want you to, I I really want you to be well. I want you to be better. Yes. And so I'm just like, there's no excuse. I'm going to give you everything. So yep. you can look at this a book and you know you can mark it you can highlight you could go oh okay this is where she said you know there's <laughs> affirmations like. there's mm-hmm. work tools you know worksheets Everything. to do for you to figure out because I wanted it to be that type of book for you yes. oh, oh yes. it looks like my bonus I got to die let me just plug it in because we don't want to be that girl in the interview <laughs> No worries. <laughs> I would want to leave Dally just talking to herself about Black Girl Little. Hold on, let me just plug this in. So, you see what happened is I went running this morning because I'm I'm invested in my well being. Yeah. And when I r- ran, I did charge my phone. I didn't have time to charge my phone before this interview. Oh, so, I wish but- I had that motivation to run. Oh, I girl, listen, man. Mm. It, 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 it's it's something <laughs> you gotta teach yourself I, I'm telling you like I sometimes do like little pep talks with myself about come on Trey come on come on yeah. you gotta do it you know but I also give myself a minimum and I'm always like okay do 10 minutes and every time I just say 10 minutes I always do more than 10 minutes so I think it's about just mm. conditioning your mind to say anybody can do something for 10 minutes yes and you always usually do more you know Okay, we will try that. When the weather gets a little bit warmer, we're going to yes, try that. Yes, that is true. That is true. Yes. <laughs> so my next question for you is, in chapter eight, you discuss drama and setting boundaries. Oh, I love that chapter. How have boundaries helped you this far? And also, how do we go about setting boundaries? It can be hard for us. I think for a lot of us, I'm a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. <laughs> so I walk through the world trying to please others and, you know, I want to be a nice person, a nice girl. And so I say yes to a lot of things in the past that I should have been saying no to. Right. Um, and so for me now, one of the biggest boundaries I've had um, to do is before I, if somebody asked me something, I would say yes right away. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things I do is I say, can I um, give me 24 hours and let me get back to you? Cause I need to think about this mm-hmm. or give me 48 hours. I don't let people pressure me into mm-hmm. things. Right. You know, like in the book, I think I said, you know, Tyrone's emergency isn't your emergency. Right. So yes. people will say, like, Oh, well, I need you right away. And you take on their anxiety. You take on their, you know, urgency and it's not yours. Right. Nope. So sometimes, that is really important. I also talk about, especially if you are successful in your family and you have more money or more financially secure than the rest of your family, the whole thing around lending money mm-hmm. is something that I really had to learn and put boundaries around of how would I financially support people in my life, friends, family members. And I wrote a whole chapter about that, of how to stop being your family's ATM machine. Yeah. Right? There's also boundaries around your friendships, right? And I did a whole chapter too around friends, right? Because Mm -hmm. some of us have really draining friendships, friendships that are no longer supporting us or no longer serving us. And you have to start setting boundaries of how much time and energy you give to people. And I'm not saying, you know, you break up with all your friends or you're, you know, or you stop talking to your family, but I think you also need to assess what things are draining you, mm-hmm. what things are empowering you, and would you choose to spend as much time with this person if they were not your family member or if they weren't your BFF, right? And sometimes you just have to really look at that. So for me, and then also when you say no, um, that no is a full sentence, right? Yeah. Period. And I write about that in the book that I'm still trying myself to get there to just say no. But yeah. now what I do say, because um, I can never just say, no, 
and just be that. But what I do say to people is I, I, I do say now, that's not going to work for me, unfortunately, mm-hmm. or um, I don't have the time commitment or the capacity to do that for you right now. Yeah. Right. And that is something that, and I don't explain it anymore. I just say, I am sorry. And, and sometimes I don't even say sorry because sorry sometimes too leads ways for people to, I just go, unfortunately, that's no longer going to work for me or mm. this book can't work for me or my schedule. And that's it, you know? And so we have to start to be really clear on boundaries and what works for us. Yeah. The part of the chapter when you said, um, I think, once it, I think you're working on the kink in my hair and you're talking about the lady who came to work with you guys and you want to go for lunch and the girl goes no and I'm like oh yeah. <laughs> I want to be her how you do that yes. yeah I wrote a part in the book where uh we were working with this really esteemed director yeah. and we were having a great rehearsal and right after the rehearsal all of us were going to lunch together and I walked up to her and I was like hey do you want to come to lunch with us? And she was like, no, no. And she just put her, her, her folder in her bag and just walked out. And I was, and it wasn't even rude or anything. It was just, this is a woman who's clear. I yes. don't have to give an explanation. Mm-hmm. I don't have to say why. And it was the biggest learning lesson of my life. And I kept saying, every time I think about saying no, I'm like, that's the type of woman. I want to be. But I haven't gotten to that yet. And so that's why I say I'm kind of in that middle ground. But I always remember that as my biggest learning lesson because I just stood yes. there going, wow, like, she the savagery of it. Yeah, she was just like, no, all right, bye. And that was it. <laughs> right. That was my favorite chapter because I'm like you, I'm I I do consider myself a people pleaser, and that's something where I've tried to break myself out of. And it's yeah. the same thing where we go, no, but oh, I'm sorry, but how can I do this instead? And I'm always trying to find like alternative to make sure you're still pleased in some way. So yes. that chapter was big for me where I'm like, okay, no, like no means no. I need to not, like you said, take on people's stress, take on people's anxiety. And I think mm-hmm. I've learned that since the pandemic within this last year where I'm like, I feel so free. Yes. I'm like, yes. you can vent to me if you want, but it's going to go through one ear and not the next. Once I hang up the phone, that's yeah. it. Yeah, and we have to see that because we all are under a different kind of rules right now, right? A yeah. different way of living. And you have to really, it's about self-preservation right now, right? And you got to protect your peace. you yeah. got to protect your boundaries. And for me, also being a new mom right now, there are a lot of things now that I, I say no to because I realize that is taking away time from my son. Mm-hmm. It's stressful being a solo parent. And I can't do and be everything to everybody because there's actually a child right now who needs me to mother them. And I've been used to mothering a lot of like full grown adults in my life. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I cannot no longer do that for you anymore. I actually have a child who needs to be mothered. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I'm telling you again. (laughs) Get the the buck. (laughs) Get the buck. Get the buck. It's all in there. It's, it's all, all it's in, in there. there. It's, all, it's all in there. Yeah. Mm. Now, throughout the book, you displayed vulnerability and openness. Can you explain the importance of allowing vulnerability? And why do we as a community have such a hard time with this? I think we've been raised by women who don't know how to be vulnerable, right? You know, yes. uh, as I mentioned in the book, I said, I think I can count maybe three times in my life where I'd see my mother cry. Mm -hmm. Um, My grandmother, the same thing. I don't think I've ever seen my grandmother cry when I think about it, right? And so we are taught not to be vulnerable. Um, And to be really real, it hasn't been a safe world for Black Mm -hmm. women to be vulnerable, right? And so I think it's essential for us to really start to look at the messaging that we got from our mothers and parents, right? That the world has changed and the world has shifted and they walked through the world in a different way and they had a different level of hardship than I think we had, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not saying that we have it easier, but I think it's easier for us now to access resources that our mother and grandmothers probably didn't have. Most of us are in a better financial position than our parents. And so we need to kind of see where vulnerability now is a safe space for us, right? Mm -hmm. And how it's okay to ask for help. 
right? Especially in these times of the pandemic, to ask for support, to tell people that you're not doing well. You know, I had two friends after I posted last week who called me and left messages and said, hey, I saw your message and I just want to check in with you. Like, how are you doing? Yeah. And, you know, and I didn't want to go to the tried and true response of, oh, I'm fine. I just said, you know, you know, this week I'm struggling. My son was sick. Um, I'm barely getting any sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, I had reports due at work. I'm trying to balance a full-time job. I'm still trying to do this book tour. And I said, it just felt like a lot this yeah. week. And, you know, all of them were just like, okay, Trey, like, you know, thank you, you know, for sharing that. And then they also talked about what they were going through. And it also gave, I find when you are vulnerable, it also allows other people to be vulnerable. Yes. And they were just like, you know what, I'm going to check in with you. I just wanted to make sure that you're okay. And they did that follow up. And it was enough for me, like, I didn't need them to fix it. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted them to do is hear it. And for me to say it aloud, yeah. to say, I am struggling with this, right? Mm-hmm. And I think us as Black women, we have to know that it's okay, you know? And I give, you know, lessons and tips in the book of how do we reach this vulnerability within ourselves and also within our own friendships and family dynamic. Yeah. And I think it goes back to, like we said, it's the balance. It's the balance of being that strong person but also allowing yourself to be vulnerable, allow yourself to be open, allow yourself to have that breakdown moment and just be like, I am not okay. Yes. No one can be perfect a hundred percent. And if they are, that's when it's a little problematic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because nobody is fine all of the time. And if that's what they're presenting, and that's why I started unfollowing a lot of people on Facebook who I just felt like everything was like, ah, look at me look at my lovely life look at wonderful life here's my perfect yeah. children here's my perfect husband here's my perfect outfit here's me with my perfect lipstick and I was just like I, I, I can't do this today I can't I just can't because then I'm comparing myself going like how the hell does she got it all together like that? exactly right so I was just like no and I started unfollowing accounts that made me feel bad about myself yes so there's a boundary as well there is. there's a boundary for you start on following accounts that when you look at them they make you feel bad about yourself <laughs> people people laugh at me and I say I do this I mean about three times a year like say it like every quarter I do an unfollow spree on social media because yep. you really mm-hmm. don't understand how much accounts that you followed unnecessarily and you'd be like do I really need to see this on my account do I really need to go on my feed and see this now it's no shade yeah, But this does not put me in a positive space whenever I come on, especially Instagram and Twitter. So I'm just like, okay, yeah. one, one by one, on follow. I think in one night, there was one time, I don't know how I had this following this much people in the first place, but one night I unfollowed over 300 accounts. Oh my God. Because I'm like, when did I follow you and why? Oh. Yes. I, follow, I just kept I, going down the list at like three o'clock in the morning. And you could also do it like with family and friends. And if they, if there's a, yeah. uh, especially on Instagram, there's, if you don't want them to know that you've unfollowed them because you don't want to cause any friction, you could do this thing called mute them, right? So they don't show up on your, t- I, I can't tell you how many family and friends I've muted and they don't know that they're muted <laughs> because I'm like, nah, you're too much today. I, I just can't, you're, you're a lot, right? So I mute them, right? And, and there's also people who are really positive and then also people mm-hmm. who are really depressing that you want to just unmute yeah. Like you just mute them and be like, you know, you are too dark. You are too negative. You are too everything. Yep. And I, I want to deal with this either, you know, and mm-hmm. all of us know who those people are. Mm-hmm. You know, every time you go on Facebook, they're in some kind of drama, some kind yep. of problem, you know, everything always sounds like, you know, they're going through man problem. I can't deal with you today. Yeah. So I just mute their asses. Right. And so j- just do that. <laughs> and they don't need to know. They don't know that you ain't following them. And so I love the mute button on Instagram and Facebook and they and no one knows no one I always say my best friend is strong because she has no social medias like you're lucky that she goes on Facebook wow that's no Snapchat no Instagram no Twitter I'm like T did you see what she's like no like I think that's amazing I need to be I want to be that person I want to be that person and it's only because I do use Instagram and stuff to, you know, definitely promote my books and plays and live events. And so, yeah. but I'm thinking about cutting down. Like, I think I might just go to Instagram and Twitter and not do mm. Facebook anymore. So we'll yeah. see. Right. Yeah. Or just like take like those social media breaks every once in a while. Yes. Which yeah. is important. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> see, I'm not the only one who does that. 
<laughs> so in the book, there are many, many narratives and references to people in your life. How did they feel about being included in the book? Or did they know yeah, that? Yeah, I talk about my family a lot. Like, my, mm-hmm. um, and even in the audiobook, um, what's lovely about the audiobook, there's a bonus interview with my mom and sister. Oh. So people love that. So go to Audible Book and order yeah. if you're one of those people who is super busy, especially me as a young mom. I love to listen to audiobooks like while I'm, you know, walking or feeding the baby, he's in the bath. I listen to books because I don't have the time to sit down and read like I used to, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, before I sent in the first draft to the publisher, I was very intentional about sending the book to my mother, my brother, my sister, my best friend, and my cousin. And I really felt that it was important for all of them to read the book and see it, and my dad as well, because I wanted them to have you know, to know what I was putting out into the world. I wasn't giving them the access to be like changing anything, but I wanted them to know and be aware and see it first. You know, I didn't Mm -hmm. think it was fair for them to get it the same time as everybody else was getting it, especially because they played such a major role in the book. And to be really honest with you, it was so funny. Nobody asked me to change anything, right? Wow. And my mother, I thought, was going to say something. And the only thing my mother uh, made me change, which was so hilarious, in the first draft of the book, I talked about how my brother used to be like just this disobedient kid, like he would never listen. And so in the book, I said, you know, my mother used to beat my brother every day because he never <laughs> listened. And so my mother was like, you take that book to that book. I don't want CAS coming for me. And I was like, well, there's a grown man now with a wife and children. Do you think CAS is going to come looking for you? <laughs> because He's like, we but have awards was- from like how many years <laughs> <Yeah>. ago? <laughs> That was the only thing my mother said to take out of the book. And so that made me just laugh. And she was really serious about it. Like she was so offended that I put that in the book that she used to beat him every day. So I, so she was like, mm, I'm, I'm not dealing with that. So I changed that. And then my mother, to her credit, she said to me, when I read the book, it made me sad um, at some points because she goes, I didn't realize that I was so hard on you and that you were going through so much alone. She goes, when I read it, I realized like how much pressure I put on you and how much you had been going through alone that I didn't know. And so it also falls into that chapter of vulnerability. A lot of times when I was going through so much major stress Mm -hmm. and trauma, I did a lot of these things by myself. And I realized I could have gone to my family. I could have gone to my friends for support. And instead, I tried to handle a lot of things on my own. Yeah. And so that was, I think, one of the biggest blessings of this book is my family and I were able to have discussions that we had never, ever were able to have before. Mm. You know, And that was really important that we now are talking in ways that I don't think we would ever have spoken if this book didn't come out. That's amazing. Yeah. And so many women have said to me too, by reading the book, they're having discussions now Mm -hmm. with their moms that they've never had, with their friends that they've never had. They're also looking at how they're parenting and how, you know, they are, you know, perpetuating just like unhealthy dynamics in their families and in their friendships. And they're trying to shift that because this book now has given them permission to do so. Yep. To be honest, that was not the response I was expecting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I, to be honest, I didn't think my family were going to respond like that, but they, they loved the book. They really loved the book. And um, like I said, if you get the audio book, you'll see um, the interview with my mom. And I think it was a really great interview. And she's doing the Mother's Day show with me this week, talking about the book as well, um, that I'm going to be doing on Instagram and also Clubhouse. So that's just something that, you know, I I just think I've been very blessed that Mm -hmm. my mother, and as I mentioned in the book, I see that she's committed to changing and evolving. There are certain things that are just will always be her as a Jamaican mom, Mm -hmm. but there are things that I've seen that she is really committed to saying, oh, and I think too, because she has seen me evolve Mm -hmm. and change and she's seen things that have worked for me. So even recently she said to me, "Mm -hmm." I read, you know, about your meditation in the book. 
send me a link to that kind of meditation thing. Let me try it. <laughs> so she'll try things, you know? And then even the other day she said to me, I think I should go to therapy. What do you think? And I just had to laugh. Like, right? Be like, is this my mother talking? So I'm like, yes, mom, maybe you do need therapy, right? So, so she's open, right? And I think people change, especially when they see the changes you have made, mm-hmm. they have made you a better person. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You just go about your life making changes, and people are like, "What's she doing over there? Mm-hmm. She's looking better. She's sounding health. Um, she's looking healthier. She's sounding more calm. She's looking more peaceful. What is she doing?" Yeah. And people want to know. You don't have to be like, "Oh, you need to change, change, change." I'm always like, "Change your damn self. Don't work go. on anybody else. Change you. Mm-hmm. Don't don't." working on anybody else and that has been the biggest thing for me I've always been about trying to change my family and I'm like I don't have any control over them no what I can control is how I respond and interact with them yeah yeah see that's that's what I'm just like that's what shocks me because the fact that we kind of have this I guess idea of what our parents are where they're stuck in their ways they're not going to change so that's when when you said like your mother actually had like an open heart to the book it's like wow yeah, she did. She yeah. really, loved she really, she really loved the book. And my mom read the book in less than 24 hours. She said she couldn't put it down and she read it. And th- yeah, that was it. She read the book. That's heart. Oh my God. That's so heartwarming. Oh, that, I just got a little emotional right there. <laughs> yes. Oh. Snaps for mom. And see, and that also <laughs> proves to how you talk about the therapy and the meditation. You're never in a sense too old to either, you know, learn new tricks, try something new, evolve you can oh there's always time to change especially your mindset and how you process certain things so i really love that for the both of you thank you thank you so much. Yeah. thank you thank oh. you now whether it be from our conversation today or part of the book that was not discussed what is one piece of advice you want black women to take away my biggest learning tool that i want black women to take away is that you are worthy of a big love and that love should come from yourself Mm -hmm. and that you are worthy of rest. You are worthy of tenderness. You are worthy to say, I do not have the answers right now and that is okay. And I really want black women to be really intentional Mm -hmm. about how we love ourselves and how much we give of ourselves to others to the point of depletion. And that you need to pour into yourself just in the same way that you are pouring into others. And that has been really important for me to learn. And and I remember um, I saw this meme once and I think I posted it on Instagram where it said, imagine if you loved yourself in the same way that you loved others, who would Mm -hmm. you be? And that was something that really struck with me because I feel I'm a person who loves, 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 who's always pouring into people, who's always building up people, who's always trying, yes, 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just thought about what if I turned that inwards and was the same person to myself that I was to others in my life. Yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of us have to take that lesson. Love you like how you're loving everybody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I love yeah. that. I'm, 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 I'm going to speak on that one. <laughs> yeah, speak, girl. Speak, speak, speak. I'm, speak. Going, I'm, I'm going to tie right into the next question, which is also the last question, but a perfect segue for it. What does it mean to be unapologetically Trey? Mm. I love when people do that. <laughs> for me to be unapologetically me is to admit that a lot of times people have described me as fearless, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you're a go-getter and you know, you just seem to just do whatever the hell you want. And and for me, it's to admit to people, I get scared just like the rest of us, but I do it with fear in my voice, with fear in my heart, with fear in my soul. I just say, you know what, I'm going to do it. And also about showing up in the world with, just knowing that who I am, I'm a person who makes mistakes. I'm a person who has loved hard and who has failed at loving someone and receiving the love that I have given back. I'm a person who sometimes, you know, 
cries in my car while p- pulling up to Burger King drive through <laughs> right? And you don't get to see those things. Yeah. But I'm also a person who looks in the mirror sometimes and be like, girl, damn, is that you? <laughs> right? And I think it's about just allowing myself to be all those different facets of Trey. You know, I'm a person who meditates, but then also listens to, you know, Drake and DMX as I run, <laughs> right? Yes. And that's the part of me. Sometimes I was like, oh, as a feminist, you should be listening to stuff like that. But that's who I am, mm-hmm. right? And I think we should be allowed to have those different layers of ourselves. We are not just this one being, right? That, you know, we're not good all of the time. We're not bad all the time. We're not nice all the time. We're all of these different things. And I think for me, I had to allow myself that notion of I can be different people and different things at all times. And it's Mm. okay. And, and show up in the world unapologetically you. And that's for me, that's who I am. You know, I'm this woman who's always working on her stuff. And sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I get it radically wrong. <laughs> but I'm always working, always learning and always evolving. And I always yeah. say to people, I wasn't even the same person I was three minutes ago. So don't expect that me part. to, this, right? I'm not even that girl three minutes ago. Mm-hmm. So, and that's okay right? You are allowed to change. You are allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to go in a whole different direction. If something or someone no longer serves you, it's okay to say, this ain't for me no more. This ain't it. Yeah. Oh, allow allow yourself to have those things. Yeah. Allow yourself. And, And that has been something that I have to really tell myself every day. Mm -hmm. you're allowed to change you're allowed to make mistakes you're allowed to say wow I could have done this differently you're okay to say I'm tired you're you're okay to say you know I'm still learning and I'm evolving so that has been and I think that's been one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from my son you know like this kid is just unapologetic unapologetically him and he expects you to love him when he's in his tantrums when he has not running down his nose when he's running up to you with uh you know a flower to give you he just expects you to love him and guess what we do right at all of those things and I'm just I want to be that like I want to be have that knowledge that I'm going to show up in all of these different ways Mm -hmm. and I will love myself in all of those ways. Yeah. And that's the biggest lesson that I've learned from him is that this is me and you've got to deal with it, <laughs> right? Ooh. Actually, I, don't, I love, I never really thought about that before in terms of like comparing it with your son. I love that. Yeah, parenting has really opened my eyes in just a whole different way where I see my son and the level of freedom and his expectation of how he moves through the world mm-hmm. and how he just believes he's lovable. And what really stays in my mind is when does that shift for them? Because when did it shift for me? Because I think all of us showed up in this world with mm-hmm. this belief that people were going to love us and that people were going to show up for us and that we were lovable just as we were. And then something happened that shifted that philosophy for us. And we need to go back to that and return back to that belief that who we are is enough. I'm going to be waiting for that book. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Manifest. Yeah, that's the second book. That's the second book. When did that shift? <laughs> I'll, I'll be here for it. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So I've been really watching him. He's been my big learning lesson, right? Because that's the one thing I love about him. He's just, he just shows up and he's fully Mm. present every moment, fully present, you know? Ooh. See, that kind of makes me want to be a kid again. The good time, the good old days. The good old days. We got to return back to that, that, you know, that, that just, glee and joy and belief in ourselves right because you can't tell my my son he ain't the shit you can't tell him that like he just knows he just walks into the room like here I am here I am love me (laughs) just love me (laughs) yeah and he he knows how to tell you no that's one kid who knows how to say no 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 for just no apparent reason he just says no (laughs) We like we need to we need to learn for him. Like little boy, tell me how you do how you how do you do it? Because he will say no for everything. No, don't want no, 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 no. 
because I'm just like, I'm, that's who I'm going to be for now. When people ask me, nope, 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 nope. nope. <laughs> or is other thing of, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> so I wouldn't be that person. I don't like it. I don't like you. I don't like it. <laughs> and we got to learn from them. We got to learn, right? We do. The children will lead us. They will lead us. We got to return back to that. They're yeah. the example of brutally honest. Brutally honest. Like, I don't like you. I don't like this. I ain't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Miss Anthony, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Oh, thank you, Natalie. I'm so blessed to have this space with you. And I feel so good. And thank you. Great questions. Thank you. And I'm so proud when I see young Black women just doing their thing. No, we so, try. We big try. up yourself, y'all. Big up yourself. <laughs> that was a trot, Toby. I'm so sorry, y'all. That's a trot, Toby. Blah, blah. <laughs> yes. You wouldn't understand unless you're Torontonians. <laughs> So before we do go, I want you to like tell people where to find you again, support you, everything. Go yes, ahead. please. I will say to people, you don't know how much it's important for us to support the book. Buy the book. Let me show you my copy. I have copies here. Buy the book, Black Girl in Love with Herself. The other thing that's really essential, and I didn't know this until I had my own book out, and mm -hmm. I realized I had to start doing this for other authors, is go to Amazon and write a review. It so helps us because every review we get, it then moves up the book and it starts to rec be recommended by Amazon to other readers. So the more reviews you get, the more Amazon starts recommending your book. So mm -hmm. go to Audible, go to Amazon and write a review. It really helps with the book. Will do. The other thing is what I've been loving is that people have been buying copies for their friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, also support different book lists, which is a black owned um, bookstore who's selling the book in Toronto, Amazon, you name it. So yeah. go out there. You can follow me at black girl in love on Instagram. I'm really good on Instagram, Twitter. I'm okay. Facebook, I'm doing all right. But if you really want to get in touch with me, Instagram is the place. Yeah. And also go to my website, treyanthony.com and just keep spreading the word. Like when you love the book, one woman did this and it really was amazing to me. She read the book and then she went on Facebook and she tagged 25 of her friends and said, you need to get this book. And then that. everybody under it was like, oh my God, I heard about it, but now I'm so glad that you recommended it. So you don't know how much word of mouth is if you can tag friends and say, buy this book, it really is essential for us. Because yes. of course, like with everything we do, they're watching to see, is there really a market for this? Is there really a need? And we have to show as black women that this is our book for us, by us. Like you said in your um, opening for your yep. podcast. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. yes. For her, by her, for us, by us. This is a prime example right here. Like we said, there anything you that you want to know is literally in the book. You yes. have the resources. You have the worksheets. I have highlighted so much of the book. Like, yes. I recommend 10 out of 10. And this is, like I said, my first, like, self-help, self-love book. Because like we said, representation matters, especially yes. in media. And that's why I, used to, I go back to your show, The Kink in My Hair. That's why my mom and I used to love the show so much every single week this was representation this was black people on screen in toronto in the west end yes have never seen that before exactly exactly representation is everything it's key it's yes. key and we have to show their support for that representation we've got to do it yeah and so that's how we do it and black people where we have the most power is how we spend our dollar yes. and we need to that and that's why they market to us and that is why um they know that there is power in the black dollar and we mm -hmm. need to support things by our community it's so essential yes oh see i'm just, just drop the mic right there, right there. <laughs> drop the mic. all right well thank you natalie so much for having me i appreciate you oh, and keep girl. doing your thing girl i thank see you thank you thank you right. so much for listening <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. Take care, love. Bye-bye. Thanks, you guys, so much for listening to today's episode. If you have any questions, comments, or podcast topics, don't forget to hit me up at unapologetically here on Instagram and at unapologetic underscore UH on Twitter. 
Also, keep in mind, you can stream the podcast on any platforms where podcasts are hosted, including SoundCloud and YouTube. Once again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know there's a couple of you out there. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Much love, peace, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.